All right, let's go ahead and get started. I'll get my screen situated here. So um, good morning and welcome. Thank you all for joining us this morning. We're excited to share some information with you all about findings from our recently released report, rapidly scaling reuse across Texas using property assessed clean energy financing or PACE as you'll hear us refer, refer to it as. Um, next slide, please, Jonathan. Um, so I'm going to go over a few logistics and then we'll um, get started with our program. So the audience is in attendee mode, so your microphones and cameras are off. Um, please type any questions that you have as we proceed in the Q&A tab. Um, audience members can vote for questions they would like to see that they would like to hear answered at the end, um, and we'll try to get through all of them. Um, we're going to be brief in our presentations and have allotted plenty of time for Q&A after the speakers. And then last, this webinar is being recorded as you all were notified when you logged in and we'll be posting it online along with the slides. So um, feel free, we'll send you a notice afterwards so you can find those. Uh, next slide. So we have uh, four presenters this morning. I'm gonna introduce um, our team and then we're gonna get going with the presentations. Uh, my name is Jennifer Walker and I'm the Deputy Director for National Wildlife Federation's Texas Coast and Water Program. I focus on water policy issues in Texas with an emphasis on urban water management, water conservation, and Bay and Estuary protection issues. I'm also very proud to serve as the chair of Austin's Water Forward Task Force. Next is Charlene Lurig. She's the Chief Executive Officer of Texas Water Trade. She is a sustainable water finance expert with experience in Texas on long range planning, infrastructure finance and water transactions. Charlene also serves on Austin's Water Forward Task Force. Um, next, we have Jonathan Blackburn. He's a technical advisor to the Texas Pace Authority. He is a co-founder of um, Texas Pace Authority, and he now assists in reviewing technical and financial analyses of projects prior to closing. Jonathan, Charlene, and I, and others are all co-authors on the report that we're gonna be talking about today. And last is Robert Stefani. He's the Environmental Program Coordinator for the um, fairly new on-site water reuse program at Austin Water. Um, Robert serves on the National Blue Ribbon Commission for on-site non-potable water systems and has a wealth of information um, on this topic. Uh, next slide. So uh, what is reuse and why is it important? Um, wa water reuse is a process of intentionally capturing water, and this is generally rainwater, AC condensate, gray water, even black water and storm water, and cleaning it to reuse for a designated purpose. Today, we're really focusing on non-potable reuse, which is water that can be used for non-potable uses, such as landscape irrigation, toilet flushing, and makeup water for air conditioning systems. This new water source is a big deal as it can make up a significant portion of a building's water use profile. Implementing reuse for property reduces water demand from your community's potable water system and also ensures that the building owner or operator will have reduced water and wastewater charges over what they would have paid without the reuse system and they'll be insured against future rate increases. We all have a role to play in making sure that we can meet our future water needs and using the water that's right in front of us is a great way to do that. Next. So do, do we really need to scale reuse in Texas? Um, the answer is yes. Reuse is an important component of Texas's future water supply. Um, we have a brand new state water plan. And in that plan, it projects that by the year 2030, there'll be over 400,000 acre feet per year of water reuse in place. This includes on-site reuse, which is in the state water plan is under the category other direct reuse. The plan projects that expanding the centralized reuse system and implementing on-site reuse will yield 179,000 acre feet of water supply by 2030. This is equal to 4.4% of the entire projected new water supply for the state um, for that year. Um, Reuse is also included under two other headings in the state water plan. Direct potable reuse comes in at 34,000 acre feet per year of water supply and indirect reuse at 209,000 acre feet per year. These are all different from each other and are listed out in our state water plan and are pretty easy to find online. Um, so what role, I know a lot of us are from Austin and um, Austin is, is 
the community in Texas that's really looking at this strategy very closely. So, um, so what role does reuse play in Austin? Austin's water forward plan counts on generating significant water supply via the implementation of on-site reuse systems, as well as connections through a centralized reclaimed water system, also known as Purple Pipe. These programs will reduce demand on the Highland Lakes, which is Austin's core water supply, thus allowing that water to be used to serve our growing population without developing expensive new centralized water supplies. How much water are we talking about? We're counting on generating 30,000 acre feet of water um, per year um, for water supply by 2040 from this strategy. This is a resilient and drought proof water supply and is a good investment for the future of our community. And for context, Austin um, currently uses anywhere from 125 to 150,000 acre feet looking out into the future. So this is a significant portion of our water supply out in the future. Next. Um, in our report, we highlight developers and buildings that are actually utilizing water reuse. Um, I want to highlight a couple examples, but we have multiple examples in the report, and it's really instructive to um, look through that and see how this strategy is being deployed across the state. So the first example is Austin Central Library. This is a 200,000 square foot facility, and it's equipped with various on-site water reuse strategies. Um, including rainwater collection and AC condensate. Um, they're also hooked up to Austin's centralized reuse system. Um, these systems provide 90% of the water that is needed by the building. Um, the water is collected and stored in a 700,000 gallon tank before being treated and transferred to a 1200 gallon cistern where it's then used for landscape irrigation and toilet flushing. Um, being able to uh, only pull 10% of the building's total water use from our potable water system is, is a real help to our system. And you can imagine what it would be like if we were able to scale this. Um, next, our next example is the Credit Human headquarters in San Antonio. They pair water and energy saving practices. Um, and they, this building also sits at 200,000 square feet. It's 12 floors and it accommodates about 500 employees on a three acre site. They use rainwater harvesting and AC condensate to provide the building's non potable water. They store this water in several cisterns that add up to about 140,000 gallons of storage. And the building is also connected to the city's recycled water system to serve as a backup supply. This facility is poised to use 97% less potable water than a comparable building. In addition, they have energy saving strategy, strategies such as solar, energy efficient windows, and geothermal loop heating and cooling system, which makes this building 40% more energy efficient than similar buildings. Uh, my team and I were very lucky to be able to tour this building and get a really up close look at, at um, all the uh, operations a couple of weeks ago, and it's really amazing what they're doing there. And then next, Jonathan. So these projects are achieving water savings gains and producing financial value. However, wide scale adoption needs to accelerate. Uh, the reality is the upfront costs of including on site reuse and connecting to the centralized reclaimed water line is higher than traditional development. We think that the costs are more than balanced out by the benefit of including these strategies and developments. Um, we hypothesize that PACE could be a good tool to help offset the upfront costs associated with these programs. And we wanted to see if these types of programs qualified for PACE and if using um, this program could effectively offset the upfront costs for these types of projects. Water supply development is important and the implementation costs are real. Um, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Charlene Lurig, and she's going to fill you in on whether or not we are able to find the sweet spot between um, building additional water supplies while managing costs. And I'll, Pat, thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. So um, thank you very much. Um, I think you already got a taste of just how deep the water conservation opportunity is when we tap into water reuse, both through the centralized purple pipe systems that um, many utilities operate, but also when we capture the forms of supply that are available to buildings themselves. 
Um, water, Texas Water Trade, the organization I run, is focused on building a future of uh, water abundance for people and for nature. And one of the reasons that we're so focused on scaling water reuse and particularly on-site water reuse across Texas is recognizing that when we have um, groundwater and surface water supplies in our rivers and our reservoirs, um, that are under increasing demand and where most of the reliable water has already been allocated and is under um, um, much more pressure from climate change and, um, and rapid development, our ability to have water security for people in nature is really going to be dependent on our um, uh, the opportunity that we seek to tap into these forms of supply that are many of which are outside of the traditional water balance that we use when we develop our state water plan or our local water plans for the future. So this is a really important topic for us. Um, and we were really thrilled in working with the Pace Authority of Texas and Austin Water and the National Wildlife Federation as we began this exploration, um, really starting from just uh, asking the question of can Pace Financing um, and Lone Star, which we'll, we'll talk about today too, um, th these very robust, well understood at this point, um, pretty highly scaled, forms of financing that have allowed us in Texas to fund um, energy efficiency, renewable energy generation on site, and uh, kind of traditional water conservation. So toilet replacements, other sorts of things that we typically associate with water conservation. Can that be used for um, water reuse, whether it's the, the cost of connecting to a purple pipe system, dual plumbing a building, so you can use that water for flushing toilets or other indoor purposes, or outdoor irrigation, um, or building the treatment and storage systems for on-site water resources that Jennifer talked about. That was the question that we were asking, and we had the great benefit of working with um, experts at Austin Water and Pace Authority, um, Texas Pace Authority, to answer those questions. And we'll let them really dive into the details. Um, but the top level um, kind of marquee um, conclusion that we came to in doing this in-depth analysis um, was that in fact, uh, pay, both Pace Financing and Lone Star um, are uh, really good financial vehicles to allow us to invest as a state, um, parcel by parcel, property by property in water reuse. Um, and Jonathan Blackburn from uh, Texas Pace Authority will talk about the specific type of analysis that we undertook to answer that question because um, Pace and Lone Star both have their own particular um, requirements that, that projects have to conform to, to be eligible. Um, but this is really wonderful news from our vantage point because as Jennifer recognized, um, it, we do need to honestly um, look at the challenge of how we pay for water reuse, uh, especially when we're looking at the costs that are imposed on private landowners um, and project sponsors uh, who typically are not paying for every new increment of a reservoir or a large scale water treatment plant. That's all smoothed out across the utilities overall rate base. But when we start looking at the costs building by building campus by campus of tapping into water reuse on the private uh, land ownership side, um, the reality is that it does impose a higher cost. And um, it's why making PACE and Lone Star work for water reuse um, is just so critically important because um, I don't think any of us who um, undertook this study believe that we'd really be able to scale water reuse um, if we didn't find a way of taking um, that upfront cost for those pipes and pumps and treatment trains um, and, and helping uh, developers remove that from um, their, their balance sheet from a kind of working capital standpoint. So um, really good outcome. And Jonathan will talk more about that. Um, the difference between PACE and Lone Star, PACE is um, only eligible for uh, private development. If you are a, a government entity um, that's building a new courthouse or you're a school district that, that is building new schools, um, PACE is not eligible for those uses. Um, and so Lone Star, which is a revolving fund operated by the um, state controller's office, is actually the vehicle that would be um, relevant for those sorts of projects, but they, they work in largely the same way. And so the analysis you'll hear of from Jonathan is relevant for both. Can we go to the next slide, please? So a couple of caveats um, that we'd love to talk about with you all today. 
um, is that water reuse on its own, when we uh, kind of did the number crunching on a number of different types of buildings, you know, high rise hotels, um, mid rise office buildings, things like that, and then all the different ways that they might be able to make um, water reuse available within the building. Um, one of the primary conclusions we came to was that just water reuse projects on their own have a hard time penciling out for Lone Star or for Pace. Um, and that's largely driven by the reality that water is a pretty um, um, low priced commodity today. Um, and so uh, the unique type of financial analysis that Jonathan Blackburn from Texas Pace Authority is gonna describe is just really hard to get water reuse projects to pencil because they can be fairly high cost and they're offsetting a fairly um, low monthly utility bill of water. Um, but the really good news is that when we modeled um, the results of co-financing water reuse um, with uh, very kind of standard energy efficiency measures that many new buildings today, um, would, it would be reasonable to assume they might want to undertake um, or that retrofitted buildings would already be internalizing. Um, it's the, uh, the economics of electricity and energy efficiency that help to pull water reuse over the finish line uh, to be conformant to those financing standards. So that's the easiest way of making these water reuse projects pencil. And we'd encourage all project sponsors from the beginning to look at the opportunity to co-finance those two if you're taking a serious look at water reuse. Um, utility rebates and other incentives also can make a big difference in helping to um, kind of get water reuse projects over the bar when it comes to that financial analysis. Uh, but just the water utility incentives and rebates uh, alone, if not matched with um, energy efficiency being co-financed through, through these sorts of um, projects, uh, are maybe not going to be sufficient. Um, in some instances they might be, but in, in more instances than not, uh, they'll be a big help, but on their own probably won't get the job done without co-financing with energy efficiency. So um, those are really big um, learnings that, that came out of this process. And then finally, something that we wanted to acknowledge, which is absolutely a limiting factor to how these financing vehicles uh, can be an effective tool at allowing us as a state to capture this really critical form of water supply statewide. Um, PACE financing and the enabling statute authorizing PACE financing limits it to only um, parcels that have already been developed. So you can be tearing an existing building down and, and starting over from scratch and you can still use PACE to finance energy efficiency and, and water reuse and water conservation in that new building. Uh, you could certainly be using it on a, an existing building that's being retrofitted and rehabbed. But if you're looking at greenfield development, so something that was previously totally undeveloped or it was um, you know, a farm or something like that, uh, you cannot use PACE um, or Lone Star for those purposes. And that really, um, you know, it, it is unfortunate because so much of the development happening in Texas today is on Greenfield. So our hope is that in a future legislative session, uh, we'll have the opportunity to address that and remove that barrier. Um, so with that in mind, and again, encouraging people to submit questions in the chat function, I'll pass things over to Jonathan Blackburn at the Texas PACE Authority. Hey everybody, uh, Jonathan Blackburn here from the uh, Texas Pace Authority. Yeah, I wanted to uh, kind of discuss in, de in um, a little bit of detail what uh, we found through our analysis. And just to start with, uh, probably worth a quick overview of, of Pace or Property Assessed Clean Energy. Essentially, Pace is a, a financing tool for um, energy and water efficiency projects that um, the idea here is uh, to enable uh, project developers, commercial property owners to, uh, to, to do an energy or a water efficiency project um, without having to come out of pocket for that project. Um, PACE is designed to be not just an environmental program, but an economic program so that, uh, you know, if you were to ask a, a commercial property owner or developer, do you want to use less energy and water, um, hands down, they will always say yes. Uh, but the problem becomes that some of these technologies can be quite expensive. So we've tried to solve that problem uh, with PACE uh, via a, a tool that allows you to do that project without having to come out of, out of pocket. 
Um, to go along with that, PACE does have an economic test um, as, as well as the kind of environmental test. Essentially, we are um, asking that the savings from a project uh, outweigh uh, the cost of, of doing that project. And the way we do that is through what we call the savings to investment ratio or SIR. And essentially we want that SIR to be greater than one. And what that means is that uh, the savings from a project and we, we measure savings as anything that has a, a cash benefit. So that could be a reduction in your energy or, or water bills. It could be things like uh, tax savings due to uh, depreciation or uh, the interest payments. Um, it could be uh, rebates uh, as well as uh, a cost of capital savings uh, using PACE is, is oftentimes a, a, a cheaper source of, of financing a project than um, other sources a developer might have at their disposal, such as um, mezzanine financing or, or equity capital. Uh, and, and we're looking for those savings to outweigh the investment of the project. And we define investment as basically the cost of, of doing the project. So the cost of the financing, the principal and the interest payments um, over, over the life of the assessment. And we, we have showed a graph here that kind of shows, um, you know, an ideal PACE project. This is what we would like uh, the project to look like in terms of cash flow, uh, that the, the cash flow from the project, the project should actually put money in the, in the property owner's pocket every year. And uh, that cash flow should uh, outweigh the cost of doing that project. And uh, hence, essentially, we, uh, what you can do here is, is essentially generate an, an infinite ROI because you're not spending any money out of pocket, but you're immediately increasing uh, the cash flow to, to your business. Uh, next slide, please. So the way we did this is we first said we want to look at what are kind of five um, common types of, of buildings that, that we find in an urban setting. And so we chose uh, what we thought of as, as five, uh, we call them building typologies, uh, hotel high rise and office mid rise, uh, municipal building, uh, high rise apartments and a mixed use building. Um, and what we did was we took a a, a typical one of those and we we chose uh, an actual example for each typology and we did a water balance on uh, each of those buildings meaning that we calculated uh, how much water uh, potable and non-potable does uh, a, a typical building in that typology use now we have to do that because if you're going to calculate how much money do you save uh, by reducing uh, your your water bill uh, you have to know where, where you start with, right? We have to calculate a baseline. Here's where the building starts. And then we, we assume that we implement the project and your water bill goes down, your water usage goes down and, and here's where the building ends up. And that's essentially how we're calculating savings. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so what we did then was we said, okay, so let's assume that for each of these five types of buildings, a property owner has a choice of what type of water reuse project do they want to do. And so we, we chose three different uh, levels of, of water uh, reuse projects that they could do, starting at the most basic, uh, which typically was some type of rainwater harvesting and possibly uh, AC condensate collection, a lot of times for irrigation uses. Uh, and then we said, well, what if they wanted to go a step farther and they wanted to offset um, more of, of their uh, non-potable needs and did some type of dual plumbing system? And then we said, uh, what's kind of the, the, the top tier, kind of the gold standard, if they're able to plug into a, uh, a, a reuse system such as the, pur uh, the purple pipe system and offset all of their, of their uh, non-potable water needs? And so uh, th those were kind of the three scenarios that we ran for um, each of our typologies. Uh, we, for, you can see kind of in detail the technologies we chose there. And we, uh, the next step in this is you have to uh, price out what is a typical one of those systems going to cost. Uh, we have to get, you know, what, it, what is a cost of that project gonna be in a typical building in order to do this analysis. Um, we did that using actual, uh, building data that we were able to find um, in within the city of Austin, as well as uh, we benchmarked that across um, various industry standards and, and um, other data sources that we could find. All right, so next slide. So uh, what I wanna do is talk very briefly about our, our kind of high level um, results. Um, the key finding, and you can see the, the tables to the, to the right and the left, 
what we did was we first modeled uh, these water projects as if they were standalone, if, as if one had only done a water project, uh, which is that the top table. And then we modeled it, well, what if you combine your water project with an energy efficiency project and looked at your building as a whole and uh, looked at your systems more holistically? And you can see the results there, you know, without reading numbers, essentially uh, we're trying to hit that SIR of one. Uh, so red means you didn't hit the SIR of one and green means you did. So uh, the key result is that you can see from that bottom table, when we combine these water reuse projects with um, energy efficiency projects, um, in every scenario, uh, we were able to uh, find that the, the SIR was greater than one, meaning that the project delivered more benefits uh, than the project cost. Um, and so that that to us is our, our key takeaway that, you know, if, if when you're looking at doing one of these projects, it tends to be more financially beneficial to to look at your building as a whole and rather than kind of piecemealing a, a project uh, to look at all of the systems and, and see where can you really get the, the most benefit from uh, some uh, uh, such a type of project. Um, we also looked at the uh, impact of um, rebates on um, the financial feasibility of these projects. And we found that rebates are important. Um, they certainly do help, uh, especially defray some of that upfront costs and, and kind of buy down uh, the cost of, of some of these systems, uh, which you know can be quite expensive at the at the current time. Um, but they're not uh, in, uh, they're not necessarily needed. And that in fact, if you pair a water project with an energy efficiency projects, um, that that a lot of times can uh, alleviate the need for a rebate. Uh, we, we do have a number of other findings in the report and uh, you know, kind of detailed methodology on how exactly we did the, the modeling, uh, which I'm not gonna go into here, uh, but I will now turn it over to uh, Robert Stefani from Austin Water to uh, conclude. Thanks, Jonathan. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Austin's program and, and the role we have in this and, and kind of some of our excitement about the conclusion the report is showing um, and how that kind of works in our overall kind of long range strategy. So the water forward plan, which is a, a long range water resources plan, um, Charlene Jennifer participated in, spells out you know, the sunset water being a large role in it. And I think Charlene had mentioned that earlier. Um, within the plan, Alternate water is, is certainly prioritized from a, a, an implementation perspective, meaning that it's what we're doing first. I and mean, there's some other large projects that are ongoing, but from a results perspective, I think with demand reduction and the on-site waters, you're, you're going to see that stuff come out of the gate first. And we, we've done a bunch of regulatory work, um, a bunch of policy work and programmatic work to set ourselves up to, to accommodate um, this on-site water uh, future that we're, we're moving into very quickly. Uh, to that end, we have uh, set up a, currently a, a pilot incentive program. It's a short-term uh, program, probably for the next two years, intended to kind of offset or gap um, the next phase of, of our incentive development. And right now it's a pretty traditional, and well, it's not traditional. There aren't a, a lot of these in, in the nation. We're thinking two or three that we're seeing at this scale, but, but the, the format is, is pretty traditional. Um, right now we're paying $250,000 for any system that is saving a million gallons per year or more of potable water or offsetting that potable water, and then kick in $500,000 at system saving 3 million gallons a year or more. Um, we have a million dollars per year budget, so we can do four between four and eight of these things, or two. What is it? Two to four per year, and the intent is to run the pilot for this fiscal year and next fiscal year, and then we will discontinue that current incentive. Um, you know, we have this incentive in place, being conscious of of what Charlene and Jonathan both had kind of talked about, which is the cost and the saving scale from a kind of a long term perspective with these things. We understand that that the systems are expensive, and the water you're offsetting is is is, is maybe an, an undervalued product, and there is a role that the utility has to kind of not defer that cost, but to participate in that cost at a certain level. 
Um, so right now we do have this, what I would call a traditional incentive in place, which are these kind of direct cash payouts, $250,000 and $500,000 based on the savings of the system. Um, but we are also aggressively looking at what I'm calling non-traditional incentives. And it's kind of a self-made up definition, but in my mind, what that means are, are things that aren't maybe necessarily directly money given to somebody else, an X and Y transfer. Um, I think Charlene has picked up on it and what PACE is, is really showing, and I think the state of Texas is something we can be proud of, um, is, is alternate financing. Some way to defer the capital cost, not necessarily delay it, but to defer it or spread it out or, or, or pay it off in a, in, a, in a way that isn't front loaded. Um, that's a really intriguing uh, 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 component to this, um, as well as the interest rate reduction from the revolving fund. I think that's, that's, that's highly unique. You don't see that very often. And it's something that in conjunction with the utility payouts or incentives um, can, can really kind of tie into this return on investment that I think the developers are going to be looking to see, or at least deferring some of that cost to make it more digestible. Um, Post this traditional incentive that we have in place, I would suspect you'll see the utility move into some type of service unit credit um, setup. Um, what it exactly looks like to be determined, we do have some precedent models that we're looking at, but really what it would be is, is some type of way to acknowledge that the reuse is going on on site and, and that there is benefit to the organized system at a certain level. Um, and how to mitigate some of those pass on costs through connection fees and meter fees that are associated with that, that capacity need um, and, and a way to, to, to balance that out. Um, and then I think the one that I'm most intrigued in that's kind of come up recently is trying to overlap or sink some of the costs into some of these future mandates. So I'll speak to that last really quickly, but you are seeing from a policy perspective, the city of Austin moving in a, in a progressive way towards some of the more environmental components of policy. Um, you have the water forward plan that was adopted in 2018. That was a paradigm shift in the way we look at water supply from a utility perspective. Um, through uh, the code next process, our watershed friends um, have some really innovative way of looking at stormwater collection and water quality within the city through green infrastructure. You may see that mandated in the future. Um, our friends over in the environmental review side are, are looking at functional green with a really kind of a, a, a green element mandated in certain building typologies uh, over and above what your standard landscape design would be. Um, these are all kind of future mandates that we see coming pretty quickly in conjunction with our own. And I think through an interdepartmental effort of collaboration, and as we've worked through these initiatives, these policies, we've, we've been conscious of kind of a longer range picture and, and have purposely embedded credits or thought in a way that we can overlap these things. So for instance, I'll use just a standard building and let's look, you know, 2025, maybe all of these mandates are in place at this time. If you have a building that you're required to put on-site water on, and reuse it as well as having some type of green infrastructure, whether it be green roof or cisterns in the, in the basement. Um, and then an additional landscape element throughout the building. Um, you know, Austin Water has a financial incentive to see these things go in. So you'll always see us have some type of play in that. Um, you're gonna be required to do water quality volume. You're gonna have to manage that stormwater some way, but if it's rainwater, which is what stormwater is, and you're reusing that, well, now you have a cistern in place that could be used commingled at a certain level, which is what the library is doing, using their water quality volume, half of it, and then using the other half of that volume for the reuse. So that hole that they're repurposing actually serves two functions, their water quality volume, which you have to do, and it's also a system for their reuse. So there's a way to overlap that. And then within the functional green component, we've embedded a pretty heavy credit on using um, alternate water or on-site water for the irrigation of that. So you've got these policies that begin to overlap. We're going to have to do something with these things, but I think we've been as thoughtful as we can as we've moved through these, these exercises to make sure that we put as much commingling within these things as possible. And then that leads me to my last point, which is there is, council has just in the last couple of weeks now, um, put a timestamp on when we'll potentially see this 
uh, on-site water mandate within the city of Austin for large buildings over 250,000 square foot in the commercial multifamily sector. And that will be 2023. So we're moving next two years to this place where you're going to be required to put these systems in. And we have this short period of time, these next two years, to really daylight everything that we have available to us, um, particularly this, the, the financial component of it, because it is very important um, uh, as quickly as we can as we move towards that 2023 timeframe. Um, and I'll pass it back over to Jennifer. Thanks, Robert. And thanks, everybody. Um, so definitely delivered a lot of information there. And um, we've got some questions already that we're, we're interested in unpacking. And we also wanted to learn a little bit about who's in the audience. We have a little poll that um, if folks want to answer, Jonathan um, can launch that. We have Jonathan Seafelt here behind the scenes. Um, running the operation. So thank you to him. And we'll just, oh, it has a countdown here. We got about 15 seconds. Oh no, it's going the opposite direction. <laughs> All right, so we've got nonprofits, utility, engineer, developer. So a pretty even mix here except for more NGOs than, uh, than the other. Great, okay, well, that's super helpful to know who's in the audience. We appreciate y'all being here. I think I just shared the poll results with you all. So um, good group of folks here. So I'm gonna stop sharing that and Sorry, I'm trying to arrange this on my screen. Okay, so we're going to, we have time now for, for Q&A and we are, uh, we have a couple good questions that we're interested in digging in on. Um, so the first one um, is, can PACE funding be used for water conservation efforts on agricultural lands? And um, Jonathan uh, Blackburn, who's an authority on this, you wanna um, talk about this a little bit? I hadn't even considered it for this myself. Yeah, yeah, sure. So the statute says that uh, PACE can be used on, it has to be privately owned, commercial or industrial real property or uh, multifamily with five or more dwelling units. So as long as it meets that criteria, it, it would be eligible. Uh, the main kind of prohibited use is on uh, residential property, right? So if it's someone's home or a homestead, that, that is not allowed. It has to be commercial or industrial. Jonathan, I'm, I'm wondering, um, do you have examples you know of, of agricultural water conservation that's been funded through PACE? Uh, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of any. Uh, we may not have done an agricultural project yet. I'm interested in that. That was a great question. Yeah, thank you. Um, and if the, it says anonymous on there, um, but if you have a follow-up question, feel free to type it in there if we didn't get to the heart of the matter. Um, we have another question here um, from our friend at the Meta Center for Water and the Environment. Um, can PACE be used on a major expansion of an existing facility? For example, the building footprint would be expect, um, expanded. Um, Jonathan, you wanna talk about that too? Yes, and the answer to that is, is yes, and we've actually done a, a number of redevelopment projects. Those have uh, actually, we found redevelopment projects tend to be the ones that where PACE is being used uh, most successfully, uh, pairing PACE with other sources of capital in a holistic retrofit. And, you know, at this point, we have, you know, probably dozens of case studies uh, with many uh, metro centers around the, the state. Uh, Dallas has had quite a few uh, Houston has had quite a few, um, even even towns like uh, we've done something in Waco, uh, a, a, a huge hotel redevelopment in Amarillo. Um, all, all of those are fine. Uh, the, the main thing that would be uh, prohibited is, and Charlene kind of alluded to this, is, is greenfield new development. So if the, the, a lot has not previously been developed, uh, PACE can't currently be used on that. But as long as a property has already had uh, some type of development on it, uh, that's totally fine. Yeah. So one of the things, too, in my experience in looking at PACE is I, I remember that uh, 
Simon properties across the state, like really retrofitted a lot of their properties for energy and water efficiency. Um, that was a large number of projects. Um, one of the things about um, installing on-site reuse is it generally, not always, but can require um, dual plumbing to be installed in the facility. So that's not something you necessarily, in most cases, would go back and retrofit, but but you can um, expand a current facility to um, incorporate that or you know do a, a major redevelopment. Um, Charlene, did you want to say something? Um, I was just looking at the Q and A's that are coming in, and yeah. Sarah Lopez had a follow up. I think a clarifying question, um, which was a good one. Um, so, if the expansion is not like the the original building itself, but maybe it's part of a campus and it's in an, an adjacent parcel, um, is that still pace eligible? So, Jonathan, could you talk that through a little bit? Well, if, if it's on the same parcel, yes. If it's an adjacent parcel, that adjacent parcel would have to have some type of development already on it. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of a kind of a gray area here. But I guess, you know, one of the things to point out is if, if you're expanding a building, um, it makes it, it's a little bit harder to do a baseline to figure out what are your savings going to be, right? So we, we define that as uh, what is the code. So for an expansion, uh, we're, we're expecting those projects to actually be more efficient than uh, what code requires it. That's kind of the, the incentive for, for being able to use PACE. And that's um, an important concept right there, that the level of efficiency, the expectation for that. Um, it would be worth unpacking that a little bit more because I know we went back and forth on that. Um, there is a basic question though that's worth maybe addressing first, which came in. It, what's the time period for the SIR analysis? Jonathan, can you talk about that? Yes, in, in Texas, we look at the SIR over uh, the period of the assessment. So if your PACE loan is, is 20 years, then we're looking at that over 20 years. If it's 25, we look at it over 25. Great. So, um, Here's a good, really good question. Um, can PACE support the maintenance cost of reuse systems, so the O&M, or is it just the installation and? Yeah, so PACE, PACE is a, a financing tool really for capital outlays. Um, the, the reason you wouldn't use PACE to finance maintenance costs is because it, it just financially would not make sense to borrow money and start paying interest when those maintenance costs are not gonna come due for you know, potentially years in the future. So the, I guess the one exception is if, if you had some type of contract that you wanted to pay for upfront, um, that was like a, a maintenance contract or a service contract as part of a project, that, that could be eligible, but um, you, know, you would normally, you would not finance ongoing maintenance because it just doesn't make sense to do that. Right. Okay. The question that came from um, Bronson, can water conservation projects alone be eligible for PACE or does there have to be a direct relationship between water and energy conservation efforts like an overlap of systems and cooling towers or something like that? Water projects by themselves are, are fine from an eligibility standpoint. Uh, the, the statute does say, if, as long as it saves uh, you know, energy or water, um, either standalone or both, then it's eligible. Uh, that's totally fine. Uh, the challenge that, you know, we, we kind of tried to allude to is that because water is, um, you know, oftentimes underpriced and, and, you know, very low cost in Texas, uh, it's harder to make those projects pencil on their own, right? So that, that's, that's where the challenge becomes is, is making that SIR hit, hit one. Mm-hmm. There's Steve Baumgartner asked a question actually in our chat box. Do you have a SIR calculation calculator template for teams to use to make the case? Um, and, and is that something that complements the water balance calculator from Austin Water? So it's worth noting that at the back of um, the report that we all published, there's a link to a water balance calculator that was developed by Austin Water in pursuit of our 100 year water supply plan, Water Forward. And that's been made publicly accessible. It's an amazing tool. Um, definitely want to direct people to that. You can find it in the appendix of the report. But this question on the SIR template, while we did um, include all of the pro formas from the different case studies or scenarios that we ran, 
Jonathan, I don't know that we made that available as a dynamic tool that was really kind of like a printout, so to speak, PDF. Is that correct? Or is there an SIR template that people can use? No, you, you're correct. So, and that's actually been something that uh, uh, the, the, the kind of PACE community has been updating over the past few months. And I think um, if it hasn't already been released, it will be shortly a template for uh, exactly how to do that. Um, that that's something that's been run by HARC and, and funded by SECO. Uh, so I think that that should be released shortly if it's not already. But you know, the bottom line is all of these projects are, are required to have an energy or water audit. And typically the engineer that does that audit uh, will be performing this just as part of that process. So it, it um, you know, it, it's, it, it's not, I guess, as it, difficult as maybe it might sound as at first, it, it's really kind of part of, of what's already going to be done as, as part of a project. If people wanted to see that when it was made available, would they sign up for like Texas Pace Authority's newsletter or where where would they put themselves in line to be notified? Yeah, that's a good source, texaspaceauthority.org or uh, HARC as well, the Houston Advanced Research Center. Thanks, Jonathan. And then there was a question. Let me scroll up to find it. We've got a bunch here. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but this is Jonathan answering lots of questions for us. Can a municipality use PACE and I would to upgrade or enhance a reuse infrastructure to offset potable water use? And like so, and would they be able to sell water to offset the cost? I, I think the answer is no, but I'm not sure. Some yeah, yeah that's that's right. Pace pace has to be. Uh, this is a a, a private uh, program, right? So it, it can't be used on on governmental owned property. Would Lone Star be uh, el eligible for that then? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, if it's a, if it's a government uh, entity, uh, Lone Star is a great option. Uh, it's the Lone Star is very similar to Pace. Uh, we we kind of designed the Pace program uh, use, using a lot of the concepts from Lone Star. And Lone Star is extremely low cost. It's, it's a very good deal uh, if, if you're a municipality. But for a utility making improvements in its own reuse infrastructure, to me, it seems more logical that you would use your own working capital as a utility, or you would seek state revolving fund, low cost kind of sub-market rate financing or something like that. Um, I think that was the question was really about the distribution transmission infrastructure for a utility. Jonathan, does that change your answer? Uh, I, I don't think so. Um, you know, if you're if you're a utility or government entity, you're honestly you're probably going to have access to uh, cheaper capital than the private sector. You know, a, a developer, or private, uh, you know, property owner can obtain, and that's probably your better source. Mm -hmm. A couple other really good questions that have come in. Um, the first one was about examples of neighborhood scale projects like master planned communities. Uh, do we have any examples of those and how PACE is applied across multiple properties with separate ownerships? So this district scale question um, is a really great one because there's such a, an opportunity there from a pure water balance standpoint, but we've run into lots of examples of the challenges of that, of sharing water across um, parcel lines and things like that. So just starting with the financing, um, do we have examples of neighborhood or district scale infrastructure that's been financed through PACE? Right, well, PACE is not, to be clear, not a residential program, right? There has to be five or more units on uh, the on an individual parcel, right? So it can't be spread across, um, you know, multiple parcels, each with a single family home. That That's not allowed under this, the state law. Now, um, you know, as, as it, because PACE is secured on, on an individual parcel basis, it really comes down to uh, what is that individual parcel and what is that ownership and the improvements on that parcel look like. Now you can lump multiple parcels together in a larger assessment. Um, we've done that on, you know, honestly, a, a lot of these redevelopment projects tend to take place across multiple parcels. Uh, but the the ownership and the improvements on there have to be uh, meet the criteria, which is uh, privately owned commercial or industrial property or residential with five or more units. And I suspect probably that that question was in relationship to more multifamily residential commercial mixed use master planned community. 
Um, but you don't know of any examples where that's been done per se, where PACE has been used for that sort of scenario? I, I don't. I mean, we've done a number of uh, apartment complexes and, and things like that, but it, it really, you know, it comes down to what is the ownership of the specific parcel that you're, you're wanting to use the pace on. Mm -hmm. And that sort of analysis, just as an aside, I think we've had initial conversations with Austin Water and others about the potential appropriateness of a tax increment finance district to, to pre-fund some of that district scale infrastructure, but I'm not sure that there's examples of that either that have developed. And I don't know, Robert, if you have any thoughts on that, if somebody's looking at that sort of context at an appropriate tool for something that goes beyond individual parcels. Yeah, I mean, part of the kitchen sink philosophy, it's something we've, we've explored. The, the TIFs, the PIFs, the PUDs, those would all be kind of council or developer initiated. So water utility in that sense, I mean, we can daylight that these are options, um, but that really wouldn't be a mechanism that we could directly pull a string on. I think TIFs, TIFs have been discussed at district scale on some projects ongoing. Um, and I haven't seen the city make much movement on that, um, but it, it has been discussed. Great. Uh, just as a quick aside before we move on to an ag uh, question, uh, Dub Taylor from the Texas Pace Authority mentions that Lone Star has been used for water meter upgrades. Um, I just lost the question, water meter upgrades and some other sort of thing that it, it just, went away while I was in the midst of reading it, but other uh, water utility investments have been made using Lone Star. So I guess I stand corrected and it sounds like there is precedent for that. Um, I wanted to ask a question of Robert, just to clarify. So one of the things that we found that is that um, surprising no one um, incentives, uh, cash incentives really help um, get the SIR um, right for um, for PACE. So the city of Austin is offering incentives for pilot projects for on-site reuse. Um, Robert, are the, those are currently available now and open for applications, is that correct? Correct, yeah. The uh, pilot program's up and going, has been up for about the last six, seven months and was, current, was just recently reauthorized for this fiscal year. And then we will bring it back um, to council for authorization for FY22. Um, we don't have plans to bring it up after that. So we've got about two years of this short-term kind of gap incentive. And then again, like I've mentioned, we'll replace it with some other type of non-traditional incentive that should be equitable from a financial perspective. If not, at a certain level, depending on your scale, could be a little more. Uh, I've seen as we kind of run through scenarios with these hypothetical service unit credits or capacity charges or whatever you want to call them, um, depending on the scale of the tract, those could be quite large offsets. Um, so, you know, the, the, when in Jonathan's chart where it has that gold pie, you know, for me, I don't expect for that gold pie and that initial part from the utilities participation perspective to really change moving forward, but regardless of what the incentive structure is over it. Um, we may be, call it by different names. It may not be a direct cash payout in the future, but it will be capital, um, which is in the end going to all be the same. So the, the the current incentive is up and running to answer your question directly. Yes, and intended to be for the next two years. Great. I'm going to post the um, the link to that information in the chat, and then um, we have some more questions to answer. And Shirley, while I do that, you want to grab the next question? Yeah, um, so we're circling back on the ag question, which is really interesting. Um, so the person asks, uh, you know, it recognizes that we haven't seen any ag projects that have been funded yet, but maybe we could just um, kind of talk through a hypothetical scenario in which an ag project might um, work out for PACE financing. And I'm wondering, Jonathan, I mean, in my experience, with agricultural water users, very in very few scenarios is the user necessarily paying for water. That is the case in some irrigation districts where they're paying for water delivery from a river authority. But in many instances, um, the, the farmer has their own water rights and their own groundwater well or surface water rights they're diverting. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, that being said, I mean, if we're looking through a groundwater lens, 
the cost, the energy costs of lifting that water out of the ground can be very substantial. And so I'm wondering if, as you're thinking through a hypothetical scenario, Jonathan, um, can you help us think through, you know, it's not necessarily just about um, it penciling out through the lens of reducing the water cost alone, because you might be starting with zero and ending with zero there, but it, maybe there's an opportunity to look at the energy cost that a producer is paying to lift that water and how much that gets lowered as part of the calculation. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and we look at when we say savings, um, that's kind of a broad term that we define as anything that has a cash value, right? So if, if there are energy savings that are associated with a water project, then certainly that can go into the calculation as well as even, you know, I, I think I mentioned earlier, things like there are tax savings, depreciation, uh, interest uh, expense savings. There are, uh, you know, even cost of capital savings, all, all of all of those types of items, um, if it if you can directly tie it to a cash flow benefit, it can go into that analysis. So really any sort of water conservation investment on a farming or ranching operation would potentially be eligible per statute. And then it's just a question of how do you make the numbers work over the length of the assessment? Exactly. The, the eligibility question hinges on, are you reducing your energy or water use? And as long as the answer to that is, is yes, uh, there's not a threshold. As long as it is going down, uh, then, then it is eligible. Then it becomes a matter of, uh, you know, kind of building the financial case for that. Yeah, I'd be, um, I know for those of us who are working in basins that are uh, specifically um, or water availability is really driven by agricultural operations. I think there's a lot of us who would be really interested in understanding more about um, how PACE maybe could be used. Um, so uh, whoever's asking that question, if you wanna reach out directly to me or others on here, we'd love to follow up on that. Um, so I, we have time for um, one more question and we've got a couple here towards the end of the queue that are asking about, um, interest rate reduction for PACE loans and what is the average range of interest rate for PACE financing? How many points lower the traditional debt financing? Um, and uh, Jonathan, again, do you know the answer? Can you reply yeah, to that, please? I can comment on that. Um, so to the first question, so PACE is not a revolving fund, right? There's This is not a government funded program. Uh, PACE is a an open market uh, funded by the private sector. So when you go to you want to use PACE, you have your choice of where you're going to borrow the money from, right? Essentially, you can pick the bank you want to use as long as that bank or entity offers PACE financing, right? So it's not a, it, it from that perspective, looks very similar to a loan. Um, it's not a credit enhancement. It is you are borrowing the money to pay for a project, and that money is coming from uh, your choice of a private sector capital provider. Um, in terms of the average you know, what, what is the cost of these? You know, they typically these days tend to be in, you know, maybe the five and a half to six and a half percent range. Um, that is more expensive than a mortgage, but PACE, we're not comparing it to a mortgage. We're pairing, comparing PACE to um, the, the traditional way that these projects are funded, which is via cash or equity capital or possibly mezzanine debt, which, um, you know, has a cost of capital in the double digits. So PACE is um, substantially less expensive um, than coming out of pocket uh, with cash for a project. Because essentially, if you're a developer, you've got a, a pool of cash, you can use it to do this efficiency project with a, a pretty decent ROI, or you can use that cash to go you know, invest in a new building with a, a huge ROI. You want to use your cash on that new investment, right? So that's what PACE is allowing you to do, is you can go and use your capital uh, on a new investment, uh, and to, 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 to borrow the funds uh, for an efficiency project in a way that's still going to generate a cash flow for you. Now, that's different from Lone Star, which is a revolving fund, right? I, I think you're, I think that's correct. Yes. Great. Do you want well, to answer the, the last question? Or I guess we're just well, at we're, we're at 1201. So um, we can go ahead and do that, but I just want to let folks know that need to drop off that um, we're going to have the slides posted online um, at texaslivingwaters.org, as well as a recording of this presentation. And I thank you all for joining us today. Um, 
And uh, please download the report and feel free to uh, reach out to any of us with questions or you can reach out to me and I can connect you with the rest of our team. Um, we are very interested in um, seeing, moving things along through this uh, work that we've done. And we can, we can spend a few more minutes answering some questions if we want, if people want to stay in line. Which one were you interested in, Charlene? I, I think uh, the one from Bronson was answered by Jonathan, but then Dub yep. asked the question about for ag water, are there other avoided costs um, that could create cash benefits for owners? Um, reduced permitting Good costs question. or other things like that. I know that um, in our experience, the labor costs can be really significant, um, especially where you have an operator that's using flood um, irrigation. There's a huge amount of manual labor involved to actually move pipes from one furrow to the next. Um, and so alongside energy, um, you know, that can be a really significant part of the ongoing operations. Um, so that would be a fascinating uh, project to do, to just uh, try to kind of work through conceptually all the different ways that um, costs to agricultural operators could be reduced. Um, so maybe that will be a good outcome of this conversation. Yeah, good question, Deb. Okay, well, thank you everybody that stuck around for a few extra minutes. Um, we appreciate you and uh, we will see you all around. Thank you. Thank you.